Let's have a look at conclusions for our paired comparison experiments. So, we need to include these things in our conclusion. We need to first of all answer our original question. We need to be able to justify that decision we make. We need to be able to describe it in context. And we've got to be very specific about who those results apply to. So remember back at the beginning we talked about who our participants were? Well that is one thing that we need to be very specific to, that these results apply to these people we tested. Okay, And then we can look at what other improvements or other investigations that we might have. So one of the things that we need to think about in, when we interpret this is because we randomly allocated pay the participants to the treatments, could with the results that we have seen just be due to chance? So is it just random that we've got the results that we have? Could that difference in medians just be a random prob um, probability? Or do we have enough evidence to say that the results tend to be higher for one of the groups? So let's have a look at what we know. As we know, if I take an arrow, okay, an arrow has got 50% chance of going in that direction, 50% chance of going in that direction, just by chance alone. Okay, random chance could go either direction, 50-50. So it means that if my graph has about 50% of the arrows going left, 50% of them going right, then I could get results just due to random chance. Whereas if I'm getting values right down the bottom or right up the top, so close to 0 or 100%, then that value isn't very likely to happen just due to random chance. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to aim for a cutoff around about 75, and that's based on a sample size of 20. Alright, so if I have 75% of my arrows going in one direction, um, then I'm going to say that's enough evidence for me that one, that we might have an effect on our variable. So let's have a look and think, remind ourselves about data. If I take that plot, dot plot of the difference, okay, and I look for where zero is, I want to see is more than 50% or oh, sorry, more than 75% above it. So remember, if I go from my lower quartile, okay, so if I go, there's my lower quartile, and if I shade in all the data above that lower quartile, all of that data there is 75%. So if more than 75% of the data is above zero, then I've got enough evidence, I've got more than 75% of my arrows will be going in that direction. Or equally, Again, compared to zero, if I go from my upper quartile and shade in everything below it, that is 75% of my data. And so if I've got more than 75% of my data below zero or above zero, then I've got to have enough confidence, enough evidence to say that, look, maybe there is something going on. Now, just a little note that if you've got a smaller sample size than 20, then you'll need a percentage that's bigger than 75%. So you might need 80 or 85 or 90, depending on how small your sample is. So that's what we want to look for. So in order to say that one variable affects the other, we need two things. We need our experiment to have to be designed well. Okay, that's quite important. And the other thing is that we need is that the difference in the medians is large enough. And that's when we talk about that 75%. Okay. So here's our example of writing times. And we've got our dominant versus non-dominant. So remember the key idea there was we were looking for 75% of the arrows being in one direction or 75% of the values in the dot plot being positive. Alright, so if I was to take my lower quarter, so I think about, well first of all think where is zero, so zero is going to be down about there, and in this case if I draw my lower quartile, shade in everything above that, I can say yes, more than 75% of my data is above zero, is positive. 
or if I was to count how many arrows are going in that direction, well in this case 100% of my arrows are all going in that direction. So again, that's more than that 75%. And I've got sample sizes here of about 20 in each group. Um, and so that 75% rule works well for this. So, in terms of my conclusion, I can say that students who wrote with their non-dominant hand tended to take longer to write the passage than students who wrote with their dominant hand. Okay, I have also can make a little, add a little comment there about the non-dominant hand times are a bit more variable. So, my evidence for that is that the whole box is above zero. Okay, so in fact, 100% of the differences are positive. So that means I'm going to suggest that writing with your dominant hand has an effect on the time it takes to write the passage compared with using your non-dominant hand. And I'm being very specific about my participants here for students in MAS2 at OEC in 2018. And because I've randomly allocated students to write with one or the other first, that means that supporting I've designed my experiment well. Okay, so that's what I want to write in terms of my conclusion. Then I want to think about, well, what could I do to improve it? So one thing I could do to improve is I could get students to write that paragraph five times. So that means I'm doing repeating the experiment multiple times. And that will give me a more accurate estimate of how long it takes each student to um, write with their hand, dominant or non-dominant. Some limitations. Well, my experiment was done with students at OSC, so it means I can only apply my results to those students in that year. So I can't assume that the results apply to any other students, so particularly ones that are younger or older than the students that I have in my class. And in order to show that younger students would have the same pattern, then I would need to do an experiment with them, with a group of younger people. All right. Equally, I could think about what other investigations this could lead me to do. So if I did this experiment again, I could, for example, use a different passage. Or I could write something in a different language. So some other changes that I could make to, to change the experiment itself. 